السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. إن شاء الله I will commence with a recitation from the Quran for purposes of baraka إن شاء الله. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. فلما استيأسوا منه خلصوا نجيا قال كبيرهم ألم تعلموا أن أباكم قد أخذ عليكم موثقا من الله ومن قبل ما فردتم في يوسف فلن أبرح الأرض حتى يأذن لي أبي أو يحكم الله لي وهو خير الحاكمين ارجعوا إلى أبيكم فقولوا يا أبانا إن ابنك سرق وما شهدنا إلا بما علمنا وما كنا للغيب حافظين واسأل القرية التي كنا فيها والعير التي أقبلنا منها وإنا لصادقون قال بل سولت لكم أنفسكم أمرا فصبر جميل عسى الله أن يأتيني بهم جميعا إنه هو العليم الحكيم صدق الله العظيم Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector of one and all. Wa usalli wa usallim ala khatam al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een Complete and perfect blessings and salutations be upon the masterpiece Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and bless all his companions. Bless those who have struggled and strived to bring the goodness to us. And may he bless us all as well. And may he bless our offspring, those to come up to the day of Qiyamah. Ameen. I know a lot of you may not be married, but that's a dua. <laughs> And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all spouses who will be the coolness of our eyes. That's a dua that is normally made and I think we should be making it at this stage, inshallah. My dearest brothers and sisters in Islam, today the idea is to create within my heart and your hearts the love of this most powerful book that exists. If I were to ask you, what's the best book you've read? Pause for a moment and think about it. What, in your view, is the most powerful book you've read? I think a lot of us would give names of books besides the Qur'an. Because we haven't read the Qur'an. We haven't really read the Qur'an to understand it. In most cases, I'd like to believe. Because I work with people. I work with Muslims as well as non-Muslims. And to be honest, the Muslims at times are more guilty of not trying to understand the message of the most powerful book in existence and that is why we find ourselves drifting from time to time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us more aware of the book that is the most powerful book in existence and we ask him to grant us the ability and opportunity and acceptance to read it with the idea of understanding it, with the idea of putting it into practice and inshallah teaching it to others and being a living Quran. If we are to walk around as a living Qur'an, I promise you, we will be so happy, so content, and everyone would actually think we are the best of people because we are following the best of messages, inshallah. So the idea is to enhance within myself and yourselves the love of this book 
and to let ourselves feel the thirst of wanting to go out and understand the message of the Quran. I have sadly come across some scholars of deen, some scholars of the religion of Islam, sadly, who have said, do you know what? It's haram to read the English. You guys are not qualified to do that. So don't read the English. Keep on reciting the Arabic. I don't know if you've heard that here in the UK, but I know the different parts of the globe that I've been to, there are some parts, some cultures would actually then infiltrate into the religion and tell you, you're not allowed to read the English because you're not qualified, it will confuse you. And I'd like to clarify that and tell you, that is the devil himself speaking. The devil himself speaking. Imagine the most powerful book in existence, the most powerful message. And people are telling us, you shouldn't be reading the English because you don't understand it. That's nonsense. Umar ibn al-Khattab as well as many others at the time of the Prophet وسلم, one or two verses moved them and changed their lives. Do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran? He says in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has, who has sent from amongst those who are unlettered. Unlettered meaning, I wouldn't like to use the word illiterate, but unlettered meaning those who were unable to read or write. At that time, if you were able to read and write, you were some huge, you know, PhD person, so to speak. So most of them could not read or write. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it is He, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who sent to those who were mostly unlettered, a messenger from amongst them who was also unlettered. And one of the reasons why we use the word unlettered is because we feel it is disrespect to say the Prophet ﷺ was illiterate. So the more correct word according to my humble opinion is to say unlettered. And what, would, what that would actually mean, or one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the Prophet ﷺ one who would not read or write is so that people would not say, as they later accused the Prophet ﷺ, people would not say that he read it from different sources and he came up with all these messages. You know, it's easy when someone comes up with a big plan for someone else to say, you know what, he just copied it. He just copied it from so and so, like what everyone else does to the Japanese. May Allah protect us. That's just an example, obviously, it might not be true. But the reality is, the Prophet ﷺ was sent with a powerful message. Those who were unable to read or write, when they heard a few verses, it moved them, it shook them, it made them cry, it motivated them, and they changed their lives. Few verses. Umar ibn al-Khattab and I repeated this last night. What happened to him? He came out to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And as he was walking there, he noticed someone who spoke to him and told him, you know what, why do you want to start with the Prophet ﷺ? Go to your own sister, she's accepted Islam. So he said, yes, that makes sense. Let me start with my, you know, with my own home. Charity begins at home. Not, not to say killing is a charity. <laughs> it's prohibited completely, believe me. But at the same time, he started at home. He went to his sister. And in the process, it's a long story, he read a few verses. <laughs> He began to weep, to cry. How many of us have completed the entire Quran in recitation as Muslims from cover to cover? We call it a khatma or a khatam. We've done so many and it hasn't even moved us an inch spiritually. You know what the reason is? We don't understand the message. That's why. If we were to understand the message of the Quran, believe me, a few words would make us realize how much Allah loves us, no matter what we've done. Every one of us are on a different spiritual level, including myself. I might be lower than everybody here because spirituality has nothing to do with what you appear like. Your appearance and your spirituality are two separate departments. They can come together and they can be handled totally separately. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be people whose inside and outside are quite similar and not people whose insides 
show something worse than what the outside is. You know, when the outside is worse than the inside, at least the person is not hypocritical, to be honest with you. But when the outside happens to be so holy, so pious, it is through the same holes that they begin to deviate. May Allah protect us. That's why the word holy is actually sometimes laughed at. So we need to understand we're all on a spiritual level. And we all are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's mercy encompasses Muslim and non-Muslim. I don't know if you're aware of that. Allah's mercy encompasses Muslim and non-Muslim, and animal and plant. But the, the, the mercy upon the Muslimin and the Mu'mineen is of a more specialized nature. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it does not say anywhere in the Quran that he is not merciful to, to those who are disbelievers, for example. If it was not his mercy, he wouldn't have guided them to Islam. Remember, somewhere down the line, all of us in our generations, even if we date back to the time of the Sahaba, there was a time when our forefathers were not Muslim. I tell you why I say this is, when the message came to the Prophet ﷺ, he was the only one at the time. What happened? He then conveyed the message to whom? To people who were mostly idol worshippers. So if he was taught to be harsh, if he was taught to be arrogant towards them, not to be of good character and conduct towards those who are not Muslim, do you think the message would have spread? If he was taught to kill the non-Muslims, as unfortunately some people believe, may Allah protect us from such deviant beliefs. If he was taught to kill those who are non-Muslims and name them infidels and rebels, do you think Islam would have spread? No, it wouldn't. The idea is to be best to everyone around us, to portray the correct image of Islam. And we all acknowledge our weakness. I am trying to achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so are you. I want to get paradise and so do you. That's a fact. My struggle is between me and my creator and so is yours, between, your, between yourself and your creator. So if we are to understand the message of this creator, inshallah, it will help myself and yourselves being better people. And for this reason, we have chosen topics. Brother Rayhan, mashallah, very correctly chose topics from the Quran and he mailed them to me and I didn't say a word because I know these topics are the ones that will motivate us the most from the Quran. And one hour is not enough to translate even a page of the Quran. But the reality is we want to create a thirst and the rest of it inshallah will continue. If we can move spiritually one millimeter by the end of these 45 minutes to an hour, wallahi we've achieved a lot. One millimeter. So I hope and I pray every single one of us can firstly understand and in the eyes of our Creator, we are equals, complete equals. People are equal like the teeth of a comb. Imagine a comb with one tooth sticking out. Would it comb your hair? No, it wouldn't. Imagine a brush with a hole in the middle. Would it comb your hair? No, it wouldn't. Would you use it? No, you would get another, a better one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us those brushes in the near future that don't need us to hold them as well. You know, I always think of technology and how far it will go. Like the, uh, yesterday, I can't remember what I said, but it came to my mind as I was speaking and I shared it with the rest. If it does, I will share it with you, inshallah. So uh, what we need to know is in the same way we would not tolerate a comb which has a tooth sticking out or a few teeth missing, we need to realize that the Muslim ummah needs to treat the rest of the Muslim ummah as a comb whose teeth are equal. So we're all equal, and inshallah, we want to achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some find the, 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 the walk slightly uphill, and some find it okay, and some need a little bit more time, some need less time, some deal with the exterior before the interior, some deal with the interior before the exterior, and some deal with both of them together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make whatever is easy for us, uh, accessible to us, and may He make us feel that we need to change in one way or another, inshallah. So let's start with the surah, a powerful surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah, which is named Surah Yusuf, with letters. These letters are Alif, Lam, Ra. Three letters. Alif, Lam, Ra. What's the idea of these? What's the idea of these letters? Let me inform you that the truth is Allah knows the meaning of these letters. They are known as Huruf Muqatta'a, separated letters. I can tell you at the time of the Prophet. The Quran had a lot of power. They heard a few verses and they began to cry, tremble. They accepted Islam. They changed their lives. So what the kuffar, what the leaders of Quraysh, who were the idol worshippers, did is they told everyone, and the Quran says it, 
وقال الذين كفروا لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن والغو فيه لعلكم تغلبون The kuffar used to say Don't listen to the Quran Make noise whilst it's being recited so that you can be winners You can be victorious Make noise whilst the Quran is being recited and don't listen to it So they used to literally block their ears with their fingers With their fingers When the Quran was being recited Ears were closed. So if you notice, the verses in Makkah are short, sharp verses. Most of the surahs that have short verses were revealed in Makkah. You can close your eyes and say, this was in Makkah. In fact, that was in Medina, sorry. Uh, if, if you were to say, for example, uh, a lot of the surahs, وَالضُّحَا وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَا All in Makkah. All in Makkah. And uh, if you are to look at those surahs that commence with these letters, they were all revealed in Makkah, besides the first two surahs of the Quran, which are Surah Al-Baqarah. Sorry, Surah Al-Fatiha is, is, has been revealed many times according to the, the, the narrations. It's been revealed in Makkah, it's been revealed in Medina, it's been repeated, the re revelation has been repeated and so on. But the, 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 the first surah after Surah Al-Fatiha is Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran. These are two surahs which were revealed mostly in Medina to Munawwara. The rest of them with these letters were revealed in Makkah. One of the reasons is the Arabs were very eloquent. Though they were unlettered, they were powerful when it came to the language, linguistics, when it came to poetry and so on. So when they heard Taha, they had no clue what it meant. And they were so inquisitive, so it, it created in them the, the thirst to know, hey, what does this mean? What is it? So when they heard Alif Lam Ra. They said, Who are Majnoon? This man is mad. They said he's, a, he's mental. You know, the Quran says, They said he's a Sha'ib. They said he's a poet. They said he's mad. They said he's possessed. What are these words? So when they heard the words, they spoke to each other. Alif Lam Ra. What does it mean? <laughs> Alif Lam Ra. What's that? Pa, ha, pa, si, mim, ha, mim. What's that? And these are separated letters. Someone saying, Imagine the lecturer get up, a powerful, eloquent speaker. Get up and says, A, B, C. <laughs> Just imagine, it would confuse you. would think he's mad. Honestly, you would. Imagine if they said, Z, Y, X. And they stopped there. And they pulled some of the letters. So this is what happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. People were, I mean, it was the talk of the town, the talk of this, the city of Makkah. Hey, did you hear those words? Tasin Mim. And he says them seriously and everybody repeats them after him and they get so much from it. And the youngsters, the children used to say, to them it was something so sweet, so good. You know, there is a story about Abu Lahab. When Abu Lahab was one of the uncles of the Prophet wasallam, he harmed the Prophet wasallam a lot. And one day, the verses were revealed, Tabbat yada Abi wa tabba. Destruction be to Abu Lahab and his hands and what have you. It's, it's a verse of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed those verses. The children of Makkah used to read those verses and Abu Lahab couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand it because the children memorized it so easily. Short, sharp verses revealed in Makkah. It, it rhymes. In fact, you know, it's happened to me, and I don't know if it's ever happened to you. When, you, when you're driving a vehicle and the Quran with a sweet recitation is playing, there are non-Muslims who said, I like your music. There's no music here. But you say, oh, thank you. You know, what do you want to say? <laughs> I like your music. I wish I could say, you want to have the CD? You know? <laughs> but the reality is they, you know, the, the truth, what stopped me from it is I said, I don't want them dancing to the Quran. May Allah protect us. You know, that's something we need to also think about. But the, it soothes a person. And I always say, you know, those who listen to music, those who listen to music, I think really it's an insult to the Quran. The reason is, do you know that the Qur'an is so powerful that it soothes every single type of a person? In the sense that those who like to listen to heavy metal, for example, or classical music, or jazz, or what have you, there is always a, a person whom they will find on the globe, one of the reciters who reads the Qur'an in a manner that soothes their taste. So some would prefer Sudais, others would prefer Shuraim, some would prefer Abdullah al matrud some would prefer Khalil al husari some would prefer a sharper recitation, short sharp recitation, and so on. So 
There is always something. If you would like to substitute those CDs with the Quran, Allah, you will achieve even more than what you had intended to achieve through the music. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not destroy us through uh, you know, things that are, uh, I would like to say, not acceptable in the Sharia, but there might be people who think at least it's questionable. May Allah protect us. Remember, I'm speaking to an audience. I don't know your backgrounds, and I don't want to say things that, that might be different from what you believe or I do. But at the same time, I want to mention the universal message of the Quran because it applies to every single person. So getting back to this Alif Lam Ra, when they heard that, as they put their fingers into their ears, they realized this verse is over. One of the reasons why the verses of Makkah are very short and sharp. The verse is over. It's finished. So as they released their, ear, their, their fingers from their ears, they heard another part of the verse. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin Short verse. These are the verses of the clear book, manifest, clear. So as they began to hear the verse, when they lifted their fingers, before they could put the fingers into their ears, what happened? The verse was over. They heard it, they blocked their ears, which gave them time to concentrate. Allahu Akbar. Imagine, they didn't want to listen to the verse, but in actual fact, they were doing themselves a favor by blocking their ears. Because as they finished the verse, as the verse was completed, their ears were blocked. And you know when you want to concentrate, you block your ears. Well, I don't do that. I don't think you do. But at that time, concentrate. You don't want any noise. We all don't want noise. And then, hey, what did they say? <laughs> and I think he's not saying anything now and you release and then Allah says then there is another verse short and sharp <coughs> and if you take a look at the verses of Makkah what do they deal with they deal with specific topics there were people worshipping idols they didn't believe in the last day they didn't believe in so many things so the verses that were revealed in Makkah deal with imaniyat those things which are to do with your belief the day of judgment they, they, they deal with uh, you know, Jannah, paradise and hell. They deal with the, 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 the reality of the angels and so on. Belief. The issues of belief. They deal with the previous nations. Any surah where the story of a prophet, of the previous prophets is mentioned, was revealed in Makkah al Mukarramah besides those two surahs I mentioned, Baqarah and Al-Imran. So if you open any surah and you see a detailed story of Musa alayhi salam, you can close your eyes and say, this surah was revealed in Makkah. Very simple. Because they didn't, they needed a message. They needed a reminder. They needed these type of reminders. And that is what came in Makkah al Mukarramah. And another very interesting point that's just come to my mind now is in Makkah al Mukarramah, these short verses, whenever the rhyme changed, the topic changed. For example, let me give you an example. I don't want to translate all of it because we want to get to Surah Yusuf. We want to get back to the Surah. Listen to these verses. Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِّرْ قُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِّرْ وَالرُّجَزَ فَهْجُرْ وَلَا تَمْنُنْ تَسْتَكْثِرْ وَلِرَبِّكَ فَصْبِرْ All that is connected to one thing, to the Prophet ﷺ and his message. Then Allah says, فَإِذَا نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورْ فَذَلِكَ Subhanallah, نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورْ The rhyme has changed, the topic has changed. Now Allah is speaking of the Day of Judgment. Then he describes the Day of Judgment. Over. Then there's a new topic. Different topic. So this is the power of the Quran. Would we know it? We would only know it if we tried to learn it. We tried to look into it. Amazing. This is the power of the book, the Quran. So. That is one of the uh, methods used in Makkah to Mukarramah. So that is why the, when they said it's poetry, they said, no, but it's not poetry because the rhyme changes after a little while. They said, so what is it? Is it a song they sing? No, it's not a song because it doesn't sit like a song. It's not, obviously, it's not sung. So what is it? Just speech? No, it can't be speech because there's something about it. It rhymes. There's something in it, you know. It's got such a powerful message. So that in a nutshell, is what happened in Makkah to Mukarrama. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who realize how fortunate we are to be from amongst those who are followers of this most powerful book that is the most memorized book in the world. And we all know that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the story of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. Why? It is reported one of the reasons of the revelation of Surah Yusuf is 
they wanted to hear a story. They wanted to hear a beautiful story. And the Arabs, and I'm sure a lot of our parents probably, sometimes you pick up books and they've got stories and that, but there is a message. The Arabs and the older people, they'd like to tell their children stories of the past in order to derive a benefit from it. And that brings me straight to one of the points I'd like to make tonight. And that is, you will only be able to derive benefit from any story of the previous prophets if you make yourself a member of that community. For a moment, you want to learn about Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, Noah, may peace be upon him, or Lot, Lut alayhi salatu wasalam, or Shu'aib, or Ishaq, or Ya'qub, or any one of them. What you need to do is when you're reading the story, make yourself a member of that community, pretend for a moment that you are part of them. Where do you fit in? You know your life. You're the one who knows your life best. Where do I fit in? So for example, I know maybe... Uh, just to give an example, say Shu'aib alayhi salatu wasalam, he dealt with the crisis where his people used to deceive in business. So if you're a business person, or if you put yourself into the shoes of, or if you put yourself into that community, you will either be a business person, or you're either a person who deals with business people, or you go to the market, you go to the shops. And Shu'aib alayhi salatu wasalam, the message was, don't short change people. So if you fit into there, if you're a business person who short changes people, you've got a lesson. And if you're not a business person, but you're a person who deals with people and you know you've been short changed once or twice in your life, or you know people are robbing you, you know, unjustified price increases. I'm sure a lot of us would agree with that. Unjustified price increases. Suddenly, everything, the price of oil is going down, but everything else is going up, for example. Why? What's happening? Remember, that will come to an end. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who are deceiving in business, they're cheating you in business, for example. It won't last forever. How do I know that? Because it didn't last forever at that time. The punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overtook them. First, what they remind us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish people immediately. He gives them a chance, and He gives them another chance, and another chance. Just like the example I gave last night, and I'm repeating it again. When a father or, or a mother has a child who breaks a glass, for example. They break the glass. The first day, dad says, hey, don't worry, no problem. We'll buy you another one. Come on, so long as you didn't get hurt. Did you get hurt? He says, no. All right, that's fine. Carry on. Next day, daddy, I've broken a glass. Oh, you broke a glass. Don't do that, son. The previous day, there was no don't do it. The previous day, we were worried about the child, isn't it? See how it changed. That's the second reminder. Third day, dad, broken a glass. What? You know, these things are not for free. You know, they cost money, you know. You better not do that again. Anyway, fourth day, Dad, broken a glass. My part of the world, bam, one solid shot. <laughs> ah, you broke a glass, the fourth day. And so on. You see what happens? We understand it normally and naturally. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a chance, it's, I know it's a different example, but let's think of it for a moment. One chance, he says, you know what, hang on, I put one little difficulty in your life. I want you to just step closer. Sometimes, some of us, it's a blessing for us because we've never raised our hands to say, Ya Allah, help me in our lives because we haven't had anything that we felt we needed help with. So Allah puts a little problem so that if that problem was the issue that made us lift our hands, I think it was cheap. I hope those problems are not too big. Because if something happened in my life to make me raise my hands, to acknowledge my creator is the boss, surely that's cheap. When I say cheap, I mean it's, it's a cheap way out, in the sense that it's not something, or I hope, it's not something huge whereby we've already lost two legs or, or what have you. May Allah protect us. All of us, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends reminders. Sometimes there's an examination. And for the examination, we call out to Allah, Ya Allah, make, make me pass, Ya Allah, I need to pass, Ya Allah. Make me, you know, let me read two rakats of salah. But your fajr, guru, asr, you didn't read, but the two rakats for my exams, I'll read. Because you know why? It's very important. And you know what? Through Allah's mercy, He still gives it to us. Through His mercy, He still makes us pass. And He still lets us proceed further. And He grants it to us. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Imagine. That's His mercy. That's why last night we spoke about Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. How merciful Allah is. He, he doesn't speak about His punishment in the opening surah of the Quran. Surah Al-Fatiha. But He speaks about how merciful He is. Because He wants us to turn. So, whenever we see a message of the previous prophets, we must... Take the message, read it, understand it, see where we fit in. There might be certain cases where, you know, we would fit in from a distance. But we need to understand that the message applies to myself and yourselves. Look at Surah Yusuf and I'm going to show you how to look at it. That's all. And then you can look at the rest of it. 
And before I actually show you how to look at it, let me tell you that when you are reading the English translation of the Quran, which we all need to read, farah, it's a duty. It is compulsory, obligatory, just like your salah is obligatory. You need to have read the Quran. Imagine if someone were to ask you, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to ask you, how many books have you read in your life? And you say, mm, you think of starting, you know, I started with Inad Blyton. I don't know what you started with. <laughs> and you know, yes, those books, those, then that, then that, then we got a little bit more sophisticated, and then we got to some books that I can't even tell you. And, and then we got to some, maybe religious books. We try. And Allah says, you read 600 books, 1,000 books? Okay, have you ever read my book? Imagine, what are you going to say? My creator, I'm sorry, I haven't. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha Ittaqullaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad Oh you who believe, be conscious of your creator. And each one of you should ask yourself what you have prepared for the day when you are going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look into what you have prepared for tomorrow. Meaning, you're going to meet your Creator. Do you know what the hadith says? مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا سَيُكَلِّمُهُ رَبُّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ تُرْجُمَانٍ Every single one of you shall speak to your Creator without any translators between you two. You will speak to your Creator, answering to Him regarding how you lived your life. Imagine if He asked you, so have you read my book? What are you going to say? Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah, we're alive, we can do something about it. We can say, you know what, we heard a motivational talk, and inshallah, we then made an intention to start. I started, but I died before I finished. May Allah protect us and grant us lives that are meaningful, inshallah. Inshallah. Meaning we can achieve something in our lives. We, we need to achieve something in our lives. And I think we need to strike the correct balance between the religious part of it and the dunya part of it. You know, the worldly part of it and the, 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 the religious part of it, 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 there needs to be a balance. Nobody would be correct in saying, just divorce yourself from everything to do with this world and just adopt, you know, only solely the deen and forget about everything to do with the secular world. No. But remember, you need to strike the correct balance. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ That that dua is divided into three portions. The first portion is about the dunya, meaning this world. The second portion and the third portion is about the akhirah. So some of the scholars of tafsir say that's how you should divide your, your balance. Two-thirds for who you are as in religion and one-third which will be in conformity to what you believe but it may be connected to the dunya. So when you're preparing, like you prepare for a house, people take a mortgage and they pay years for that house. They pay for years. They're preparing to have a house which will last how long? Say, for example, you ended, you finished paying for your house at the age of 45, 40. How many more years do you have to live? I guess another 40, if you're lucky. Right? So you, you, for 40 years, you struggle to buy a house to, to be used for another 40 years. How, what have you done for an investment for the house that you're going to use thereafter? That's a question. There's the Quran. That's the book. That gives you the answer. Free investments, inshallah. With returns, inshallah, that won't be bashed by inflation and by the dropping of the pound and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So, when we are reading the Quran, there are three types of verses we need to understand. Three. I told you it's far. The first type the bulk of the Quran, very simply understood, very easy to understand. When you're reading a story of the, old, of the prophets of old, it's easy to understand. When, you, when Allah says good people will have goodness and evil people, if they do not repent, will, will, will get a recompense for what they've done. It's simple to understand that. Tit for tat, isn't it? If someone does good, they'll get good. If someone does bad, if they don't repent and they don't say I'm sorry, probably they will get something similar in return. May Allah protect us all. Through His mercy, sometimes He still doesn't do that, you know? Through His mercy, when someone does bad, still He gives them another chance, as I said, and another, and another, and sometimes right up to the end, He keeps on giving them chances. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really be pleased with us and may He make us from amongst those who walk towards Him every day rather than walking away from Him. I mean. So, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us in most of the verses of the Qur'an which are simply understood to get closer to Him. And it's very easily understood, the first type of verses. The bulk of the Qur'an. The second, 
those verses, when you read the meaning of them, when you read the meaning of them, a question develops in your mind. A question develops in your mind. Like you read the verse which says, Yes, they ask you, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, regarding intoxicants or alcohol and gambling, games of chance. Tell them there is a great sin in it, meaning in the two. And there is benefit for man in the two. Now when you read that, obviously, you think to yourself, what, what's the benefit there? Isn't that a question? It comes to your mind. It would come to your mind. Oh, you who believe, do not find yourself in the state of intoxication when you get to salah. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm allowed to drink? Does it? It's a question. As soon as a question comes to your mind, you need to jot it down and ask those who know. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالزُّبُرِ Ask those who know the scriptures if you don't understand, if you don't know. Ask those who know. You ask them. Listen, I read this verse in the Quran. Tell me, what does it mean? I, I don't, I fail to understand it. Don't arrive at your own conclusions because you end up drinking alcohol, believe me. <laughs> and you end up doing so many nasty things. Like, I give you an example. The Battle of Badr, and this is something very, very pertinent. It's very important, especially here in the UK and the USA. We need to know these verses. The Battle of Badr is mentioned in the Quran. The Battle of Uhud mentioned in the Quran. And it's mentioned in a narrative, and sometimes it's mentioned in such a way as though you are there in the battle witnessing it. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, go out and execute them, that does not mean in any way that it applies to me and you today. No, it doesn't. It is speaking about the Battle of Badr, like if there was a battle, say the Falklands, that took place some years back, some decades back, and there was a little caption of what the commander of the army had said at the time. And he says, fire, come on, kill all of them. Does that mean all the British need to kill everybody else forever and ever? No, it doesn't. And this is where the deviant Muslims, sadly, we have to say that, use, or maybe the enemies of Islam, use such verses to con people who don't really know the Quran properly to show you a portion of a verse. Look, you guys are terrorists. Look at this verse. It tells you kill the infidels. Look at this. Just take a look. And you look at it. <gasps> and you don't know that this is actually referring to something totally different. You could pick up a book of British history and show them worse things than that. That doesn't make them barbaric. They're probably some of the best of people. Some of those whom you might be studying with might be more polite than anybody you've ever known in your life. And they're not Muslim. And our duty towards them is to treat them even better. Inshallah. So this is why I say when there is a question, immediately ask it. And ask who? Don't just ask anyone. Ask those Ahlu Dhikr, those who know, those who have knowledge, those whom you trust their knowledge. So you trust somebody's knowledge, ask them. You know, listen, I need this thing here needs to be understood. They will answer the question, inshallah. That's the second type of the verse. The third type are those verses, as I read, Huruf Muqatta'a, those separated letters that a lot of the Mufassirin have said, only Allah knows the meaning of these verses. I have come across some opinions where they've tried to interpret some of these huruf muqatta and so on, but the vast majority of the Mufassirin say that only Allah knows the meaning of that. Uh, there are some verses that, uh, like these verses, huruf muqatta, if you say Qasimim, why Allah revealed them, He knows best. We might be able to say a few things like what I said today, but the exact meaning of it, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But that also, uh, we, will, we will take it at that and stop. We wouldn't want to know more than that. If we are told, look, only Allah knows the meaning of these verses, you stop there and you're satisfied with it and you continue. So these are the three types of verses, inshallah. Yusuf alayhi salatu was a young man. As, in fact, when he was very young, he had a dream. And this is the beginning of the surah. And I'm sure a lot of us would know the surah. It appears also in the Old Testament. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the story appears in the Old Testament has mentioned the story and said it is Ahsan al-Qasas. There are so many lessons derived from Surah Yusuf and I'm going to teach you how to derive lessons from it. He says, Oh my father, 
Oh, my father, I've seen a dream. Just that, we can stop there. Oh, my father, I've seen a dream. That shows you how close he was to his father. He had one little nightmare, or it wasn't even a nightmare, but a dream which he might not have understood. And he was so close to this parent of his that he immediately went to his father. My father, I had a dream. How many of us are close to our parents? How many of us, inshallah, well, I hope we all plan to be, and I'm speaking mainly, I think, gauging from the age of the crowd, I think the bulk are not married. When, when you do have children, inshallah, think to yourself, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet uh, Ya'qub alayhi salatu wa salam, was so close to his son, imagine what type of relation they had. Any, anything was related to me. My father, I need advice. Look, I've seen this dream. I want to know. Imagine. So we, we just starting the surah, we've already come up with the first point of benefit, the link between the father and the child, and how important it is in Islam. That's the story. Then he says, oh, my father, I saw a dream where there were 11 stars, there was the sun and the moon, prostrate to me, prostrate to me. And the father says, Ya Bunayya, Ya Bunayya la taqususu iyaka ala ikhwatika fakidu laka kayda. Oh my son, be careful, don't relate this dream to your brothers. They might plan and plot against you. Now the son, thinking these are my brothers, my dad is telling me, not to mention to my brothers? Think for a moment, do you think that Yaqub alayhi salatu was salam erred in his upbringing of the children? Do you think he gave his children anything less than the best? No. He gave them the best upbringing. He was a prophet. But still he was concerned to say, you know what? This inna shaytana lil insan mubin. Definitely shaytan. Shaytan is an, a clear enemy against man. So be careful. So the father explained. Now when we instruct our children or when we are instructed, you know, sometimes a generation back, the older people used to say, hey, read your salah. Come on, read your salah. What? You know, do this, do that. Without an explanation. No explanation. So what happens? People are ducking and diving. Next thing, no wudu. <laughs> <laughs> salah is done. You see? Why? Because they're doing it for the father. The father didn't explain. Hey, you know what? You sh if you read your salah, this is what will happen. Or read your salah because X, Y, and Z. Meaning, meaning this is the explanation. Even if you've got to explain a few times, when you explain to someone why you'd like them to do what you want them to do, that makes it so much more, res meaning so much more acceptable to them. Because you're explaining to them. That is what we learned. The father didn't say, hey, don't tell your brothers. He said, listen, don't tell your brothers. They may plan against you. But remember one thing. It is shaitan who's the enemy, the outright enemy. Okay, so he, that explanation came through. Surah Yusuf, Allahu Akbar. It teaches us a lot. Explain to people what you want, why you want them to do what you want them to do, and so on. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously here, we, we need to look at what happens between brothers, between blood, between blood. Sometimes you can have grown up together, you can have had so much together, but shaitan can come between brothers and sisters. And later on, at the end of the story, we will see how it unfolds, inshallah. And I'm sure a lot of you would know it already, where he forgave his brothers. That's another quality. It's your blood. You, know? it's, you need to be forgiving in order to continue. If the more baggage you hold in terms of, this person did bad to me, right, never forgiving them. That person did bad to me, never forgiving them. So that, that, that is baggage. The more baggage you have, the more depressed life you would be leading. You need to learn to let go. Let go. Okay, forgive them. Okay, it's fine. Still smile. Still carry on. You know? Let go. Continue. Because it will make you a happier person. So, this young boy was told not to tell his brothers because they would probably plan against him. Look at the thinking of the father. He thought very, very far. You know, if this child, he obviously knew the meaning of the dream. He knew it. He was a Nabi. And he says, if this child tells his brothers, they might feel that, you know, they might understand the meaning of the dream. They might feel something. Shaitan might make them think, you know, this youngster is being favored. He's being favored because the father is, you know, telling him things or they've got a link, or, you know, which he, they, he doesn't have with us. And that's exactly what happened. Allah's plan. The brother couldn't keep a secret. And that brings me to another point of benefit. The hadith. You know what the hadith says? You'll be surprised. Many of you may be surprised. 
the hadith says istainu ala qada'i hawa'ijikum bil kitman seek assistance to accomplish what you want to accomplish by being secretive about it did you hear that seek assistance to accomplish what you want to accomplish by being secretive about it don't tell everybody everything don't that's the hadith of the prophet rawahu ahmed it's reported in the sunan uh, ahmed so the Prophet ﷺ says that when you tell someone, if it is something good, they might just become jealous of you, they might block it, they might, and if it is something bad, when, when it's like, for example, husband and wife, if a person is married, and say the wife goes out and says, you know, my husband, you know, this is what he's doing. And uh, two days later, she so resolves it with the husband, and everything is back to normal. And that friend of hers is going around the village saying, you know, they're not getting on. They really, it's on the brink, it's on the rocks. What rocks? Those are the rocks they're sitting on and having a picnic. May Allah protect us. It could be happening, you know. Yes. So don't go and relate everything to everyone. You should know who you're talking to. And you should know when things are over, you can tell them, you know what, mashallah, I'm married. Sometimes, even if you're engaged, you don't need to tell anyone. Sometimes. When is that sometimes? When you know, if I'm going to spread news, they're going to make anonymous phone calls. You know, she's a dirty girl. Well, you know, this guy here, hang on, I've got a video. Let me send it to you. <laughs> you know, why? You, you, you know the man, you know the person, everything is there. People nowadays, probably, I know of stories, because I'm a marriage counselor, I know of a, a case where a certain lady came to me and told me, you know what, my husband's left me, but it's me to blame. And I said, what do you mean? And she explained to me a very gruesome story where she had initiated anonymous calls to the husband who was already married to someone else because she wanted the guy, she wanted the man. And very sadly, acting completely outside the fold of Islam, she began to say, you know, uh, th this is what's happening and that's what's happening. She, she actually phoned the, the, the wife and she says, your husband, I know this and I know that. And she knew a little bit because she, she knew the guy from, you know, some years ago. And she succeeded with four telephones to create such a division between the two who were happily married that it ended in a divorce. And naturally she fitted into the puzzle when she fitted into the puzzle she got married and she was the happiest person the first night she something out of her joy made her tell this man Do you know what it was me <laughs> <laughs> she was so happy and you know what he did he walked out immediately immediately he walked out and you can imagine and he never he, he later divorced her as well and he didn't even touch her and she's now crying to say, you know, everything worked. It was unbelievable. It was a dream. I told her, but you woke up. <laughs> <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really, really make us understand that you don't tell everyone everything. We learned that from Surah Yusuf. Imagine the father saying, listen, don't tell your brothers. Relax, take it easy. Don't tell them everything. But sadly, he made a mistake. He told them. So they said, ah, this, this person is too close. These two are too close. Maybe he's favoring. Why are they so close? You know, let's plan. Plan to do what? Let's plan to kill him. That's exactly what they said. Imagine brothers. If a brother can plan, a son of a Nabi can plan the, the demise, the murder of their own brother, yet they've had a solid upbringing which we do not question. I'm sure a lot of people could actually think, hey, I wish this person didn't even live. Obviously, you know, people wouldn't want to murder nowadays because you know. And if anyone had to think on those lines, they'd probably be thinking of the jail sentence immediately thereafter. It wouldn't be worth it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. But people say, I wish this person wasn't here. I wish they were dead. Some people wish it for their own parents. I wish she wasn't there. Look at her. She doesn't even want to accept the guy I want to marry. It happens. Honestly, I've seen it. People wish their parents were dead. And what we need to learn from that is, when we do have children, some of us probably do. I've got five children of my own, alhamdulillah. When, when we do have children, we need to realize one thing. The day they come up with something, listen to them. Try and understand them. You know what? I'd like to marry this person. Listen to them. Accommodate it as far as possible. Accept it. Yes, if it's something totally outrageous and wrong completely because of what Islam teaches, not because of what your culture has created as a divide, no. Because of what your religion teaches you, then maybe you can talk, them, talk to them, explain to them, address the intellect in them. If they still feel they'd like to do that, let them make the mistake. Because they still remain yours. If you don't let them make the mistake, you will be a criminal until the day they die. And I know what's happened. I know. A lot of people meet up in universities. And they end up getting married. Alhamdulillah, some of them work. 
But some of them, they got to know each other for the wrong reasons. When you, get to know, when you want to marry someone, you should have an intention in you, I'm looking for the father of my children. Someone who's qualified to be the father of my children. You know? Not just the next most handsome dude. You know? <laughs> and then, when you're looking for a female, in the case of the, the, the young men, look for someone who's, whom you would be satisfied with as the mother of your children. A person with principle, a person, well, whatever you feel you'd like in, in the mother of your children, inshallah. Remembering that the mother plays the biggest role in the, in, the, in the life of a person. So, when people get married in varsities, for example, sometimes what happens is, if they've married for the wrong reasons, the turbulence commences. And after that, what happens is, it breaks. May Allah protect us all. That's the, that's the worst thing. But right now, I think the bulk of marriages I've seen, actually, they are either in turbulence, about to break, or just broken. May Allah protect us all. So, what I was saying is, when such people go to their parents and say, you know what, I'd like to marry someone from Honolulu. <laughs> and I said that because I hope there's no one from Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> so, the father says, what? Over my dead body. That's how it starts. And then what happens is, it progresses and progresses. If the marriage doesn't happen, the day that girl or boy is married off elsewhere, they'll always say, you know what, I didn't really want to marry you. You know what? My father's to blame. You know what? They didn't want. They didn't let me marry who I wanted, and so on. So that is why I say nowadays there's a new remedy. And that is explain to them, try and talk to them at the end of the period that you've stipulated. You know, for trying to convince them. When it expires, you tell them, you know what? Really, we'll go with you. It's okay. Carry on. That's the way forward. Because nowadays we're in a free world. They'll probably leave you and say goodbye, mom. Goodbye, dad. I'm out. We don't want to lose them totally. We'd like them to understand what we're saying. Let them make the mistake. And I know of people, the day it's broken, they come back, Dad, you were right. I love you. Hug. Big hug. Well, I'm your dad at the end of the day. You see? Rather than saying, Dad, I blame you for all my woes because you didn't let me marry who I wanted. So there is a way of doing things. In this particular story, Yusuf والسلام, was given the best upbringing his brothers were. They became jealous. They planned his murder. And one of the oldest brother said, You know what? Don't murder him. Why are you going to kill him? Just, just send him off to a far off land, or maybe throw him into a pit or something, and, you know, get rid of him in another way. Don't be so, so, so bad, he's your brother. So from this we learn that, you know what, sometimes when people maybe backbite about you or oppress you in one way, you will always have, amongst the larger circles, someone who will defend you, or who will try to protect you, or who, who, who will be a lesser than the others. You will always find it. Believe me, in your family, if you've got a large family, and I know of a lot of people you know, who, who have confirmed this. If someone says something negative about you, you will always have someone who will stand up and say, no, that's not true, come on, you know, she's not that bad. And things. So this is in the Quran. You see it's a large family. Someone stood up for, for you know, one of his own brothers. And he said, you know, don't kill him. Anyway, now the lesson comes for all of us here. Obviously, these lessons are for all of us, but one which is closer to us. I'm sure every one of us have had someone who's jealous of us, or who we think is jealous of us. And sometimes they plan and plot your downfall, or we think they plan and plot our downfall. <laughs> Why I'm saying this is, do you know that mostly people think that people who are not jealous of them are jealous of them. And mostly people think that those who are not planning their downfall are actually planning their downfall. But it's not true, it's just in our minds, mostly. Believe me, mostly that's the case. But the rare cases where people actually do plan our downfall, that's a point of mercy. That's the opening of your doors. That was decreed for you to get you to a level that you would never have got to. Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, if they had not planned what they planned, would he have come out and minister at the end? Never. Allah had a huge plan for him. The starting of it was... Le that, that jealousy, which is the, one of the first satanic qualities. What, is, what was Satan's crime? Ana I am better than him. I am better. You know, me. That's Satan. Sorry, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Satan, the devil himself. He says, I am better. I am better. And that made him hate Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and plan so many things. That's why we are on earth. Would you be in Nottingham if it wasn't for that devil's plan? You wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't know where I'd be. But that was Allah's plan. And then we came onto the earth thereafter. 
So the same applies. When we have someone planning our downfall, rise to the occasion. Continue. You remain focused. Remain focused. Don't, you see, you are now walking from point A to point B. When person X is trying to do something against you, arriving at point B, and you happen to turn to now face, to focus at person X, you're now going to C. You're never going to get to B. Remain focused and continue. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu alaykum anfusakum la yadurrukum man dalla. Oh, you who believe, be concerned about yourselves, develop yourselves, be worried about yourselves. Those who are astray will not be able to harm you or will not be able to distract you if you yourselves are rightly guided, if you yourselves are focused. So remain focused. You know, there is an example that I would like to mention of a young man whom after I spoke about Surah Yusuf in one of the venues, he came to me and he says, I'd like to share my story with you. And I said, what is it? He says, I used to work for a certain person, and we used to sell stationery. And he was dishonest with me, and he treated me very, very badly, and I had no clue what to do. And I used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah show me the way, Allah show me the way. And he says, one day the problem became so big, they accused me of stealing, and they accused me of so many other things, and he fired me. He just said, listen, get out, out. And it was so bad, and I decided, look, I forgive him, and I carried on. And I carried on, and I sat, and I was reading the paper. And in, in the newspaper, I, I'd seen a column where somebody wanted some stationery. And I said, hang on, let me source the, the stuff and sell it to them. So he phoned, and he says, look, I can get you this at this price, at a good price, because he knew a lot of people because he was at, in, within the stationery business. And he began that, and he became a businessman so big, that in three years' time, the man who fired him depended on him for supplies. Amazing. He became bigger. And I told him that's exactly the message of Surah Yusuf. Those who planned the downfall of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam were the ones who found themselves lower than him so much that they had to come begging for food after a few years. Begging for food. You know what, if you don't give us food, what are we going to do? And he looked at them, and he knows who they were. That's Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. Look at the lesson we're deriving from the surah. So, if someone plans your downfall, don't stress about it. Be focused, carry on, have a big heart. But don't fall. You see, like, if you have reactions in the sharia, in, in Islam, if someone gives you a slap, what to do? You know, the Bible tells you, well, give the other cheek. Get another clap. The, 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 the Sharia tells you, you're allowed to retaliate, but you, you may forgive, and you'd probably be better if you forgave. But the true criteria, or the true uh, reaction to someone who would, who would serve you with a shot, for example, is to think first. That's what Islam says. Think. If I were to react, what would happen? If I were to forgive, what would happen? And do that which is best. That's the Islamic way forward. So if someone does something bad to you, you don't have to do something bad to them again, though you have the right to revenge and retaliate. As a Muslim, you need to think, if I react this way, what will happen? If I react that way, what will happen? And you need to do. For example, if a little, if a small person came up to you and gave you one slap, you could probably slap him back. Hey, you know. And sometimes, if Mike Tyson came up and served you a shot, you'd have to say, thank you, sir. <laughs> because you know, if you gave him a shot, what would happen? <laughs> That's the end of everything. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all, inshallah. <laughs> so, amazing. There's a story that came to my mind, but we'll share it towards the end if there's time, inshallah. Uh, so, this is what happens. When, when someone plans your downfall, think about it, continue, don't hold, and inshallah, that, don't hold grudges. That will result, inshallah, in your development. And I, I can give you so many examples, and I'm sure you probably, if you think about it carefully in your lives, you may have seen it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they planned his downfall, they lied to the father. They lied to the father. That, oh my father, or, oh our father, let him come with us, we'll play, we'll look after him, we'll do this, we'll do that. And the father says, you know what, I fear that a wolf might eat him. I fear that a wolf might eat him. You know what they did? They used that example. They actually got an idea by what their father said. They got an idea. They said, yes, when they came back, after they had, uh, you know, put him into the, 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 the pit, and they came back, the, you know, after that, 
after their plan. They told their father, you know what happened? A wolf ate him. So what do we learn from that? There's a lot to learn, but I can tell you one thing. Sometimes we give people ideas. We do, by saying things. We give them ideas. A person didn't have an idea. And that is why I am against television or news channels that show people what the criminals did and how they did it. Why? Because they're innocent youngsters who are watching, oh, there was a bank robbery and this is how they did it. And they say, hey, guy, did you see that? It's quite simple. <laughs> what did you do? The news channels are guilty, really, of sometimes making more criminals just by telling the world how they did what they did. Why? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Imagine where we fitted Surah Yusuf into all that. Amazing. That he said, I fear a wolf might eat. Might eat the children, you know, my son. They came back, they said, yes, a wolf ate the son. And the father knew it deep inside. He says, no, man, you know what? I know from Allah what you don't know. What was that? The Mufassirin have said so many things. Inni a'lamu min Allahi ma la ta'lamu. I know from Allah that which you do not know. The majority of the Mufassirin say he knew the dream and the interpretation of it. And he knew it has to come to pass and it has not yet come to pass. So there must be something. The child is still alive. But it is so stressful to know that your child is alive but separated from you. And from this the hadith says, Man farraqa bayna walidatin wa waladiha farraqa allahu baynaha wa bayna ahibbati wa bayna ahibbatiha yawm al-qiyamah or baynahu wa bayna ahibbatihi fi dunya wa al-ukhra according to the different narrations. Whoever separates a parent from a child, Allah will separate them in the dunya and the akhirah from this, those they love most. It's very, very bad. And I think this happens more when divorce takes, takes place. Sadly. Because I've dealt with so many cases where a divorce has taken place and suddenly one of the parents walks away with the children, contaminates them, sadly, to say, you know what, they're bad, they're evil, don't go to see them, and the child, the child then doesn't want them. Believe me, it is so difficult upon the other parent, if only we knew. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. But this story of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam towards the end, and I'm going to go back and come back to make the point. Towards the end, they all beat up. And that is so much hope for those who've been separated from their parents. Or for those whose children have been separated from them. So much hope to say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors in a manner that you've never ever dreamt of. You hadn't imagined, inshallah. The time shall come. They were separated for a period of round about 40 years, according to the various narrations. I think 40 is the most correct. They were separated for about 40 years. The man had changed. The youngster had changed. He knew his brothers when he saw them, but they didn't know him. Why? When they buried him, he was young. He didn't have a beard. He, didn't, he was a young boy. They were all quite grown. You know? After the age of uh, 22, 23, I don't think your facial features would actually change so much, especially in the case of males. Because if you were to have a beard and you had it, at that, at that age it was already there. People would recognize you, but if they seen you at the age of 12 and 13 and then saw you at 32 with a beard, they will they'll find a little bit of difficulty in recognizing who you are. So he recognized them, they didn't recognize him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned the tables. That's also in Surah Yusuf. Then what happened? One problem. That problem was this young man is in the pit. The next problem, a next huge difficulty. People were passing by. And you know what they did? They saw this well and they released their bucket in order to get some water. And when this young boy saw the bucket, according to some of the narrations, he clung to it. And it came up and it was quite heavy. <laughs> and as it came up, lo and behold, there was a young boy. So what they said, Ya Bushra, hada ulam. Oh goodness, this is a young boy. Why were they saying, oh goodness, this is a young boy? The next part of the verse gives everything away. They kept him a secret as merchandise. Merchandise. You know when you find something, hey, that's a wallet. Quiet. What are you going to do with it? Open it and see what's in there. 
Oh, there's no money in there, but what's there? Oh, there's a gold coin. We'll sell it. Keep quiet. We'll sell it. May Allah protect us. You know, it's, it's a typical reaction. I hope not from us, inshallah. I wonder what we would do if we found a few hundred pounds there. I think we'd give it back, wouldn't we? <laughs> so, so, well, then again, I don't know, because when you're a student, you, know, you need the money. <laughs> So that's exactly what they did. They said, look, this is merchandise. We can make some money. We'll sell this child. And they literally enslaved the child and sold him in the nearest market. And who bought it? So that was another problem. That was another problem. Do you see what happens? And I can tell you what happens. You may have seen it or not. Sometimes when a person is vulnerable, a person who's been sexually abused, a person who's been abused in one way or another, when they come to you for help, or when you see that they need your help, sometimes some of these people who have no humanity in them, seize that opportunity to make the matter worse and to abuse them further. That's what's going on in the world. So this child was abused. This child was thrown away. This child needed help. And what happened is those who were supposed to help the child made it worse and sold the child. Imagine. From this we learn that we should not be doing this, inshallah. We are Muslims and over and above that human beings, meaning human beings and over and above that Muslims. We, we should be, when someone needs help, we should be helping them, assisting them solely with the intention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarding us in return. That's it. As Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا When we feed you, we will feed you, meaning the hungry. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without intending any thanks from you, without intending any reward from you, nothing. If a person makes dua for you after you've helped them, alhamdulillah, that's the best. But now you want a favor from them? No, that, that's not proper Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us proper, so to speak. I'm using terminology that I picked up here in Britain. So, this is something we need to learn. But, another point we need to learn is sometimes when there is one point of negativity that has occurred in your life, it might not resolve itself until another 10 points of negativity have happened. Don't think, oh, somebody's put a spell on me. I know there's some communities who immediately jump to that, and they blame people, and they visit others, who tell them, yeah, you know what? One of your extended family, your sister-in-law did something on you. Yeah. That's exactly what they say. I believe me, I've dealt with crises. How? Your sister-in-law, do you know why they say that? The unseen is only known by Allah. And now this person portraying to be a big sheikh comes to you and tells you the name of a person who's supposed to have done a spell on you. Astaghfirullah. Where is your iman? Where is your belief in the unseen? How can you ever believe that? Do you know why they say that some of your family members have done a spell on you? Because they know every extended family has a little bit of politics. And normally, sisters-in-law, you know why they're called in-law? Because the lawyers come in play. The solicitors come in <laughs> Sisters-in-law, father-in-law, it's law. Hang on, here's the law. My rights and your rights. That's what we speak about, don't we? So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Don't just blame anyone. She's probably the most innocent person. The only difference is, the five fingers are not the same. And they haven't adjusted themselves to bring themselves on one level. You see? If you adjust, you can always come on to one level. Five fingers are not the same. Everyone says that, isn't it? And I say, well, if you, if you bend slightly this way and that way, inshallah, you'll get it all in a line, inshallah. You can even comb your hair with your fingers. <laughs> so, the Prophet wasallam has taught us this. Don't doubt people. Don't just come across and tell people X, Y, and Z without authenticating it because you'll be accusing people without knowledge. And then, you will regret it later. So, we're not allowed to just believe people did things on us. That's the plan of Allah mostly. One negative, two negative, three negative things in my life, four negative things. It doesn't mean there's a spell on me, somebody's cast a spell. No, it's part of the process. Look at Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. The second thing, he was sold. The third thing, the lady who had actually, who was in the house of the, the, the man who purchased him, had evil intentions. Oh, what a good looking guy. Oh yeah, man, dude. You know? <laughs> That's exactly what happened. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. That's exactly what happened. She had an evil intention. And you know what this young boy did? He turned away. Imagine, he turned away. And he said, no, there's a creator watching me. Amazing, a young boy in his teenage years turning away. 
and say, you know what, Allah is watching me. And that's why he was gifted by Allah. Wallahi. You know, it, I, I promise you that when a person does things solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that they can fulfill what they want to, but the only barrier between them and fulfilling what they want to is Allah, they arrive at a new spiritual level every time they do that. You know when Salat al-Fajr, time clocks in, and you know you can sleep. Who's there? Nobody. Nobody's watching. I know Salat al-Fajr, I know. But I'm only going to get up because Allah's watching me. And you communicate with your Rabb. That's something I think a lot of us fail. Fail in. Communicate with Allah. Talk to Him. Speak to Him. He can hear you. His knowledge is everywhere. His power is everywhere. His sight is everywhere. He doesn't miss a thing. Ya Allah, you're watching me. I'm in the bed here. I'm getting up. He's, he's responding. I'm only getting up for you. He says, oh my gosh, I love you. Come, let's get up. Amazing. Imagine if you're... And I'm going to say boyfriend or girlfriend, meaning outside what is permissible in Islam. I'm going to say that to show you that it's, it's a relationship that's probably not condoned in, in Islam. But if such a person had to tell you, at 2 in the morning, please get up every day at 2 and phone me. I think we'd set our clocks and we'd make sure we phone. And if she says, get up and jump, we'd probably say, hang on, hang on, darling. Get up and start jumping. <laughs> <laughs> 2 in the morning. Why? You want to prove a point to someone to say, you know what? I love you. That's all. What about your own creator telling you, you know what, for your benefit, for everybody's benefit, for, for the whole Muslim ummah, get up and read your salah at least. It'll help you before anyone else. Imagine if you would say, Ya Allah, for the love I have of you, I'm going to get up. Don't you think you'd arrive at a new relation with your creator? There we are. Whenever you do something, for the sake of Allah, do it. And there, there is an effort required. Look at Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. What stopped him? He had a mansion. He had a wealthy man who was a minister, according to the narrations. For even beyond. And the wife of the minister. And apparently she wasn't bad looking. Yes. And then what happened? There was privacy. There was everything. They didn't have to book a lot, and so to speak. May Allah protect us. I'm using this term because I know it happens. May Allah protect us all. But what they did, it was all there. Still, he says, no ways, Allah. He says, Ya Allah, save me from this. Ya Allah, they're talking of jailing me. Ya Allah, I don't mind a jail term. I don't mind a jail term, Ya Allah. But I don't want to do this, Ya Allah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. I think we've got a lot to learn from this. The world power. A person needs to have world power. You know, I never judge a book by a cover. If I see someone... I regard them as probably better than me. No matter how they dress, no matter what, what they look like, whether they, you know, whatever it is. Because deep down, they know, and Allah knows, they might be closer to Allah than I am. They might have certain deeds that Allah loves. And I might have deeds that have really put me on the side. May Allah not do that to us. Each person, there is a struggle. There is a struggle. To get closer and closer to our Creator. But let's walk up the ladder and let's never get down. One of the ahadith say, Thalathun. Man kunna fihi wajada bihinna halawat al iman. There are three things. If you find these three things in you, you will taste the sweetness of iman. The sweetness of iman. The first thing. And you hibba rajula la yuhibbuhu illa lillah. To love your fellow Muslim. Solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can stretch it slightly like the pound devalues our time can devalue each other. And I've got, I've got a clock with a Chinese battery. <laughs> so, uh, please feel free. If anyone would like to leave, I don't feel bad, inshallah. But at the same time, I'll try to stick to what time limit I've been given, inshallah. The first thing is to love your fellow Muslim solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else makes you love them. Someone says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu Immediately there is a link between you and them. Immediately there is a link between you and them. Whether they are on your spiritual level or not is besides the point. It's besides the point. There is a link. You will help, you will assist. I know in South Africa, I've visited a lot of universities and you know question time? They ask you questions. And I've come to one conclusion and I've learned that. You know when the brothers, Muslim brothers and Muslim sisters, if a Muslim sister is stuck because her motor vehicle has a puncture, she will get non-Muslim guys who will stop first. And the Muslim guys with the biggest of beards, they will probably mm, carry on. Why? She's not dressed properly. You know, let me just carry on. That's what happens. Why? 
So you waited for your Muslim sister to be assisted by someone who was not a Muslim solely because you felt she was not on a certain spiritual level, you might be worse than her. In fact, your going away with that sort of a feeling made you worse than her. Allah, Allah. We need to understand this. And then there's another problem. Those who do stop, sometimes they, they stop for another reason. <laughs> wow, I waited for this day. Hang on. And stop. And then you pause. You know what, you know what happens thereafter? May Allah protect us. That's why the hadith says solely for the sake of Allah, pleasure of Allah. I didn't exchange numbers, I didn't do anything, nothing. She probably wouldn't even see me again. You know? There we are. Solely for the sake of Allah. Someone will make a dua for you in your absence. Inshallah, your life will continue. The, the, the second point that we would need in order to taste the sweetness of true Iman. Imagine that point would let you taste the sweetness of Iman. The second point, the first one is, أَنْ يُحِبَّ الرَّجُلَ لَا يُحِبُّهُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ And the second one is, Sorry, the first one is أَنْ يَكُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا سِوَاهُمَا For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger to be most loved than anyone or anything besides them. So if you love Allah and His Messenger more than anyone and anything besides the two, inshallah you will taste the sweetness of Iman. And we've, we've spoken about that. Like sometimes there are certain things we contemplating. I need to do this, I need to achieve this, I need to achieve that. Think to yourself, the third thing that is mentioned there is what made me say this whole hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, أَن يَكْرَهَ أَن يَعُودَ إِلَى الْكُفْرِ كَمَا يَكْرَهُ أَن يُلْقَى فِي النَّارِ To hate, to go back into, the, into disbelief in the same way that one would hate to be thrown into the fire. What does that mean? The, the, the deeper meaning of that is to hate to go back on your spiritual achievements. That's what, it's, that was, that's what is meant there. So for example, you have, and I'm going to give you a typical example, no offense to anyone, a girl, a Muslim lady, a Muslim woman, who's dressed in a miniskirt, and alhamdulillah, she feels one day the need to cover her legs, and then she wears her jeans. What happened? MashaAllah, she developed, I'd say, a huge percentage, huge percentage. I'm not saying anything is acceptable or not acceptable, I'm just showing you how the development continued. So she shifted from a miniskirt and she covered her legs. Thereafter she says, you know what, I think I'd like to you know, wear something slightly looser, meaning slightly less you know, revealing. So she begins to wear pants that are a little bit, you know, baggier. Alhamdulillah she's achieved a lot. And then she says, you know what, I think I can put on a scarf on my head. MashaAllah, she's achieved so much. She's getting so close at such a quick pace, alhamdulillah. Closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There we are. And then she has that. Then she says, hang on. I think I can read one salah a day. One salah a day. MashaAllah, she solved 20% of the salah problem because there's five salahs in the day. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, I think I'll read two. She solved 40% of the crisis. She's only got 60 left, 60%. And one day she says, you know what, bugger everything, I'm leaving all this, take this thing out, I'm out, no more salah, no more nothing. That is now going back on your spiritual achievement. So the hadith says, when you move forward, don't move back. You should hate to move back on your spiritual achievement the same way you hate to be cast in, you, you hate to be cast into hellfire. There we are. So when you achieve something, you need to continue with it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can achieve and continue achieving. Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, after that, he was thrown into the prison. Imagine, one problem, the second problem, the third problem, this is the fourth one. All, all together. Amazing. And he was in the jail. In the, in the jail, he sees the opportunity to engage in da'wah. There were two prisoners with him who had told him something about the dream. And that's also something very interesting, if I can pause on that for a moment. When he entered the prison, there were two others who were in the cell. They looked at him and they told themselves, you know what, this guy looks like a nice guy. Obviously, I'm wording it differently. This guy, you know, he looks like he knows something. He looks knowledgeable. And from this, believe me, those who have knowledge, those who, uh, those who would be able to help you, generally, you can just see it in the face. You just feel something to say, you know what, uh, I think I can settle for this. <laughs> In the sense that I need assistance and this is where I'm in. You can generally pick it up. And sometimes you find people, your heart just doesn't incline towards them. You say, you know what, 
I think I'm just, I'd rather just stay away. <coughs> Obviously, when, when it's a doctor, then you have no choice. Especially when, when they're now cutting, you look at his face and say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Allahu Akbar. But to take your deen, unduru mimman ta'khuduna deenakum. Your deen is very important. Be careful where you're getting it from. Be careful where you're getting your deen from. Make sure that it's the right person. So these people asked him a question. They looked at him, he looked reasonable, they gauged him, they asked him the question, look, we've had dreams. Before answering the dreams, he, he told them, look, Allah is one, and so on, and he gave them da'wah, and so on. That teaches us we need to seize every opportunity to engage in da'wah. Imagine, he was in a prison. He called people who were not Muslims towards the deen. We are not in a prison. We're in a university where we are as free as birds. Not in a cage. Surely, we should at least live as Muslims so that those around us can admire the fact that Islam is actually a religion that teaches you a lot. And really it does. When people look at us dressed Islamically, you know what happens with me a lot? A lot. People see me and the first thing they do is, oh. <laughs> they look away. And then you, if, if they hear you greet, say, hello, how are you? You're fine, you're okay. And speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then what happens is, as you develop, they, it breaks the ice. You talk to them. It happens a lot in the aircraft. Sometimes you're sitting next to a female, and you know, you know she moves to the side. You know? And then you look, and you've got no option but to sit. You know? And then moments later, it happened to me once when I was arriving here in London, and I, I was filling in the, the form. And I took out a Zimbabwean passport. And the lady says, oh, you're from Zimbabwe? I said, yes. You speak English? I said, yes. <laughs> well, I'm also from Zimbabwe. I said, welcome, welcome. <laughs> there we are, you know? And then it turned out that she was an elderly lady. Her grandson was in the same class as me. We, we artists, we used to draw together. Amazing. And she says, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, you know, and it was good. It was nice. Imagine if I wasn't myself, what would have happened? So this is why we need to seize the opportunity to, for doubt. That's what we learn there. Then we have, obviously, the time is quite limited. Let me whip through it slightly. We have the problem where Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, when he came out of the prison, he had his brothers. And he, didn't, he thought of a plan of how to get to the bottom of it. He didn't know the feelings of his brothers at that moment. If he told them, listen, I'm Yusuf, immediately. He probably, they might have reacted differently and, you know, did something else. So he thought of a plan. I know I was close to this one. He's not here. He's my blood brother. Let me ask for him. He asked, he hatched the plan and so on. So in order to achieve certain, certain things, you might need to plan in your life. You will need to plan, but you might need to hatch a plan. Meaning you might need to do something that people may not understand immediately and so on. I hope it's for the right things, inshallah, not for the wrong things. So thereafter, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam decided to put one of the cups of the king into, one, into the bag when the brother came in and they found him, they called him a thief but he wasn't a thief that was a plan to keep him there when they kept him there the rest of the group went back to the father besides one, the oldest one refused he said look we promised our father that we're going to bring everybody back and I'm not coming back until he forgives us because there is one who is short the other one, now we're going to be ten you'd rather go nine of you and I'm going to stay back when he stayed back, the nine of them went, the father sent them back, and that is when Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam realized these people are crying, they've come, they've said our father's lost his sight, and immediately he says, look, do you know what you did to Yusuf and his brother? They were shook. قَالَ هَلْ عَلِمْتُمْ مَا فَعَلْتُمْ بِيُوسُفَ وَأَخِيهِ إِذْ أَنْتُمْ جَاهِلُونَ Do you know when you were ignorant? So he's already presenting an excuse for them. When you were ignorant, do you know what you did to Yusuf and his brother? They said, are you Yusuf? Are you him? Why did they say that? Because nobody knew what we did besides him. Nobody. So, is that you? He looked at them and he says, Ana Yusuf wa hadha akhi qad manna allahu alayna I am Yusuf, this is my brother. Allah has blessed us so much. Allah has really granted us so much. Imagine, he didn't say, right, you guys, all punished, come on, cops, lock these guys up, put them in the prison. Look what they did to me. 40 years of my life, lost. <laughs> I think typically some of us might think in those lines, but don't, don't. 
So what? 40 years of misery, but that one we would probably look at it. Yusuf alayhi salam didn't. He seized every opportunity, he lived every day, and he continued, and he, he knows he seized every opportunity he had. And then Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam says, Allah has blessed us. They say, oh, forgive us. Forgive us, really, we are so sorry. You know, Allah has raised you higher than us, yet we were the ones who were planning your downfall. And he says, don't worry, you're forgiven. Go back to our father and tell him, and let them all come. Go back to our father and tell him, and let them all come. And he gave a shirt, and, and the story continues where the father had sensed. sensed. And parents can sense things, believe me. Parents sometimes can sense things. Sense things. I know my mother... When we go out, we, we go out to the rural areas a lot on humanitarian trips to distribute food amongst the suffering masses. May Allah protect us all and never put us in that condition. So when we go out, once there was an accident that happened and my mom felt something. And she says, hey, you know, I'm not feeling well. I don't know. Phone everybody. Ask them how they are. And that's exactly what happened. She phoned here, there, there, there. When they got to us, she said, no, they, we've had a little mishap. A slight mishap. That's what it was. What was that sense? That's the bond. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes brothers and sisters can feel it as well. And Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam's father had lost his sight. There is new research which proves uh, the connection between a certain type of a cataract and the sweat of man. Because the sweat of the shirt was actually that which cured uh, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. There is also research that proves a connection between stress and weak sight. When you have a lot of stress, worry, and all that, your eyesight becomes weaker and weaker. That's there in the Quran, Surah Yusuf. It's possible. May Allah grant us all good eyesight, inshallah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says how Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, and this is the last point I'm going to mention because of time, inshallah. How Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam had received his father, his mother, and 11 of his brothers. And they all came, and at that time it was permissible to actually prostrate. The word used in the Quran is prostration. Today they would probably say bow down. But it was a prostration which was permissible at that time. They prostrated and he says, oh my father. That's the interpretation of the dream. This surah has so many dreams in it. It, has, it starts with a dream. It ends with the interpretation of that dream. In the middle it has a dream of those two who were in the prison. Mm -hmm. And just after that there is a dream of the king which we haven't spoken about which was there and interpreted. So one might ask, well, I dream a lot. What's the meaning of dreams? Nine times out of ten, dreams are just what you've been thinking about. Nine times out of ten, dreams are just your, you know, something you've been concerned about, something you're worried about, something you're thinking about, you dream about it. But one time out of ten, it's probably a message to you. If you're concerned, ask someone. Ask someone who knows. Look, this is a dream I've had. You know, I'm concerned. It's repeating itself. Can you explain to me, or do you know anyone I could go to? And go to someone who's not shady. You know, go to someone who's not going to tell you, right, you're dying in 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Please, because I know of people who've really had that and they've suffered. So go to someone reliable who'll give you a proper interpretation of the dream. There are some books that give you interpretations that are weird, you know, really. And sometimes reading these books doesn't really help because our dreams are slightly different and we. Someone says, oh, if you see this in your dream, if you see milk in your dream, it means this. And they say, oh, well, now what should I do? You need to ask someone who knows, inshallah. And when he received these people, who in his initial dream, he'd seen the sun, the moon, and 11 stars. Who depicted the sun? The father. The moon? The mother. The stars? The brothers, the children meaning the parents' children. I want to tell you a point that I came across from one of the scholars of religion, of deen. Amazing point. And that is, do you know the qualities of the sun? What are they? They are the same qualities that need to be found in a successful father. The qualities of the moon are the same qualities that need to be found in a successful mother. And the stars are the children. And I need to dwell on this for a few moments. The sun is powerful. It is there. It has light. You see when the sun is there. You can actually you feel secure. You feel solid. Plants photosynthesize. They continue, honestly. It's the sun. Everything hustles, bustles. People go to work. 
and so on. The sun is out. Wow, we're so happy. We can play. Let's go out and do this and do that. The father's role in the house. He is that figure. Are the stars there when the sun is out? They're there, but you can't see them. <laughs> Why do you say no? They're there, but you can't see them. That shows that the role of the father is so solid. The children are all there. But really, the, the, the father's role has overpowered everything. He's, he's there, solid. That's the father. Can you look at the sun directly without some form of, uh, uh, you know, a barrier? No, you can't. Well, that, that would probably depict the respect of the father. Not to say you're not allowed to look at him, but respect in the sense that, look, he's the fatherly figure. He's the one, really, we respect him. The mother, oh, beautiful, mashallah. Look at the moon, alhamdulillah. So sweet, alhamdulillah. And you know what? The stars come out and twinkle when the, when the moon is there. Oh, that's the close relation and bond between the children and the moon. Meaning their mother. And what happens? The moon is beautiful, calm, quiet, relaxed. Everything is there. The children are there. You, you know, they twinkle. Everything is around. As soon as the sun rises, the moon is there, but you can't see it anymore. And the children, mashallah, they twinkle. I won't mention too much about the stars, but I'd like to get to what I'm saying. And that is, when mother wants to play a role of father, and father wants to play a role of mother, what happens? Let's get to the sun. When sun wants to come in the way of the moon, and moon wants to come in the way of the sun, what happens? What? Eclipse. There is an eclipse. When there is an eclipse, what happens? Both of them are gone. And the stars are nowhere to be seen. So when mother mixes role, wants to play the role of father, father wants to play role of mother, we have a social eclipse. Both of them's significance disappears. And they've now confused everything, and the children are the first to lose. That's just in a nutshell. I can go further. Let me mention one more point, just to, to tickle your mind. The moon, one of the qualities of the moon is it's not there every day. Sometimes it's there, full, complete. Sometimes it's half. Sometimes it's less. And it goes through... A 28-day cycle. A few days, it's not there. You can understand that. It fits exactly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Remember, the examples granted to you in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book cannot be wrong. You can dive into these examples and you can swim forever and ever. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our minds. I hope and I pray that this evening I've spoken to you and I've spoken to you as colleagues, to be honest with you. And you noticed that. I hope I've created a little bit of an interest in the Quran, inshallah. And I hope we can pick up this book and try and read what it says. And read, you know, get the deeper messages of the Quran and look into these stories, derive lessons for ourselves. You know, people are being oppressed for years on end. Look at the story of Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun. Look at the story of uh, Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. What happened? And so on, so many examples. And inshallah, through that, we will be able to achieve a lot, inshallah. This Quran is a book not meant to just be recited but also recited together with understanding it. And I call on everyone here to try and learn the Arabic language because when you understand the Quran through the Arabic language as it is directly, it has a power, it has a halal, it has a sweetness, it has something in it that will motivate you, it will change you if you really want to read it for the sake of reading it. And inshallah, it will help you develop and become closer and closer to your creator and mind in the same way, or, or should I say, in such a way that the day we die, we're actually the closest we ever were to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiya Muhammad. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa baraka.